This video is supported by Brilliant. This video was a mess. Guys, I've been doing this channel for six years now, and I still, every once in a while, will run across a video that just, just breaks me. Just breaks me. Like, I thought I knew what I wanted to do with this video. And then I, then I didn't, and then I did, and then I looked at the research, and the research didn't quite line up with what I wanted to say, so I thought about scrapping it all together, and then I thought, no, maybe it's important to put the stuff out there that, you know, contradicts maybe what you want to be true. We need to be re-examining our beliefs, you know, this is an important thing in the world right now, and, and maybe I should just do that and lead by example. Long story short, I wanted to do a video about how renewables like solar and wind are definitely absolutely going to take over for coal eventually, not because of some environmental do-goodery or whatever, but because simply it is cheaper. It just makes more economic sense. I mean, when it all comes down to it, that is what's going to determine our energy mix for the future, you know? I mean, I, I, would, I would love to say that you know, we could read the writing on the wall and make the decisions to transfer our energy production from one thing to another because that's what's best for the world and the planet and our species, but that's not the world we live in. I mean, there is evidence for this, that wind and solar are becoming cheaper and could eventually take over for, for coal completely. I mean, over 30 states in the United States produce most of their energy from renewables, and that's amazing. So I dug into the numbers thinking that it would paint a very clear picture, and it the picture was not as clear as I would have liked for it to be. There's a lot of room for interpretation, anyway. So that's basically what this video is gonna be. I'm gonna look at the economic formula that determines the efficiency of the different types of energy systems that we have going on right now, and just, you know, see what we can glean from that. So strap in, because we're gonna get into some economics up in here. God help me. Last week, the U.S. saw Joe Biden get sworn in as our next president, and on his uh, list of agenda items, on top of, of course, getting COVID-19 under control, one of his biggest agenda items is climate change legislation, including rejoining the Paris Climate Accords. And look, that's great, I'm all for that. Government regulation and policy definitely has a role to play, but as long as energy generation is a private enterprise, it's all gonna come down to the money. Like any private enterprise, you have to have a margin. You wanna be able to sell your product for more than it took to make it and that way you make money for your shareholders. If you're making, say, a vitamin supplement, like I do, then there's a fixed cost for this bottle that I have to buy, right? Like I can buy it from the labs, there's a little bit of fluctuation for scale and whatnot, but for the most part, I don't have any control over what I have to pay for this. Now what I can control is what I sell it for, so I make sure and sell it for a margin that helps to keep the business going. Now with electricity, it's, it's kind of different. The prices are not set by the people producing the power, it's set by third parties. So, you know, the guy running the electricity plant on, on the edge of town, they're not the ones telling you how much you pay for that electricity. So in order to make more money selling energy, it's all about producing it as cheaply as possible. Luckily, we have nerdy ways of determining this, and those are the levelized cost of energy and the levelized avoided cost of energy, or the LACE and the LCOE, or the LACO, the look away. <laughs> look away. Look away, baby, look away. This is basically a measure of how much energy you're getting per dollar spent or the amount of dollars you're spending per unit of energy, or in fancier language. They are the estimates of the revenue required to build and operate a generator over a specific cost recovery period of time and the revenue available to that generator over that same period. The LCOE is the one that's used most often, and it's sometimes called levelized cost of electricity instead of energy, but the acronym's the same, but it basically measures the amount of efficiency of a plant over its lifetime. Again, in fancy language, it's the ratio between all the discounted costs over the lifetime of an electricity generating plant divided by a discounted sum of the actual energy amounts delivered. Typically, this is measured in dollars per megawatt hour or cents per kilowatt hour, and it involves a whole list of variables that I can put up on the screen right here. Uh, there are videos that go into detail on this that I'll link down below, but suffice to say, it's thorough. So then there's the levelized avoided cost of energy, or LACE, and this actually measures a plant's utility to the grid as a whole. So again, in fancy talk, it reflects the cost that would be incurred to provide the electricity displaced by a new generation project as an estimate of the revenue available to the plant. Like, say you wanted to replace a coal plant with a solar power plant. It would show you what costs you're avoiding by doing so. Costs like maintenance, fuel costs, cost of management, and that kind of thing. Basically, if the LACE is better than LCOE, 
you're in a good situation. Now mostly we'll be talking about the LCOE for this video. That's what we're gonna use to compare the different types of energy production, but I wanted to mention the LACE just so that you know about it. And one disclaimer before we get into the numbers is that these numbers are projected and estimated out for 20 to 50 years. So there's a lot of variables, a lot of things can change in that time. So it's not really an exact science. Um, there is an exact formula for it though, and it looks, it looks just like this, so. There you go. But that's just a disclaimer. It's not perfect, but it's the best we've got. So let's just start these things off with the bad boy itself, the old standard, coal. Coal obviously has been used for energy generation for a very, very long time. I don't need to go into the whole history of it here. That's not necessary, but suffice to say, it is a mature technology. Um, there's not a lot of improvement left to be done on coal. But it is, as we all know, one of the worst drivers of climate change. So any improvements that are made to coal mostly are made towards making it cleaner. Now, clean coal is a term that we've heard a lot, the idea being that you can capture the carbon as it comes out of the smokestack, making the process cleaner. I mean, great idea, in theory, uh, but in practice, most CCS plants don't capture all the carbon. In fact, some of them only get like 10%. And then what they do with that 10% is to sequester it underground, but the way they usually use it is to pump it into oil wells to kind of push out as much oil as possible, just kind of squeeze it like a grapefruit to get every last drop of oil out of there. So, you know, you're putting it underground, which is good, and that extracted oil can help offset the cost of the CCS systems. But they are using CO2 from burning coal to get out more oil to burning cars, which will create more CO2, so yeah. Cool. All of that aside though, coal is good at a lot of things. It's reliable, it's scalable, and it's cheap. The holy trinity of energy production. But again, it is about as efficient as we're likely to get, and coal plants are about 37 to 47% efficient. But because coal is so cheap, it does still have a low LCOE at around four cents to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Next up is natural gas, which a lot of people associate with fracking because that's been in the news a lot. Uh, but to some, it's the holy grail of energy production because it's cheap and considerably cleaner than coal. Granted, that's a low bar. Natural gas is usually used in peaker plants because they can scale up really quickly. If you need some extra energy, just open a valve and boom, you got energy. Being so cheap with improved technologies for extraction, the LCOE for natural gas is unsurprisingly low. Fossil fuels are bad for the planet, but man, they are, they're super savers when it comes to cost. All that gives natural gas an LCOE score of two cents to eight cents per kilowatt hour. Going a bit more green, next up we've got hydroelectricity. This is electricity that's created by moving water at dams and reservoirs and whatnot. Hydro is crazy efficient, almost 95% efficient, and uh, all you really need is gravity. Gravity does the work, and the fuel is free. There's a little bit of maintenance along the way, but for the most part, it's just free energy once you get it set up. Now, of course, there are a lot of upfront costs. Dams aren't cheap, and they also tend to uh, destroy a lot of land and uh, displace a lot of wildlife. But over the lifetime of a hydro plant, those costs can be made up many times over because dams and hydroelectric plants can go for decades, even centuries. And it's for that reason that hydro has a great LCOE, though it does produce different results according to the scale of the plants. Small hydro goes for about two to 26 cents per kilowatt hour, and larger hydro goes for one to 28 cents per kilowatt hour. From the power of water to the power of air. We're just making our way through the planeteers at this point. Wind is obviously super clean, but it's not without its problems. Uh, for example, it has a lot of concrete involved in making wind farms and concrete actually puts a lot of greenhouse gases into the air. Then there's the problem of what to do with the blades at the end of its life cycle, which is already starting to become a concern. And then there's the old issue with migrating birds, which actually they found out that if you paint one blade black, it actually reduces bird deaths by quite a bit, which is kind of a weird little trick, but it works. But still, once you set up the turbines, it's just nothing but energy with some maintenance, which gives on land wind an LCOE of four cents to 12 cents per kilowatt hour. So that's on land wind farms. Offshore wind energy can actually get a lot more energy because the ocean is flat. There's nothing in the way of the wind. So it's a lot more consistent and it's a lot more strong. Some of the bigger offshore wind farms include the Beatrice Offshore Wind Farm in Scotland. It has 84 huge turbines that create energy for 450,000 homes, or about 588 megawatts. Other success stories include the London Array and the Gemini Wind Farm. Overall, offshore wind does have a lot more upfront cost. I mean, you're building out in the middle of the ocean, which adds a lot to the complexity and everything. But once you get it set up, it's, it's pretty much out of sight, out of mind. But that upfront cost does increase the LCOE score, giving it 10 cents to 21 cents per kilowatt hour, almost double that of on land wind. 
Solar is one of the fastest growing energy sources in the world, it's one of the cleanest sources of energy, and it's becoming more efficient all the time. Once upon a time it was thought that solar PV couldn't actually get above 30% efficiency. This was known as the Shockley-Kaiser limit. Now that limit itself was later recalculated to 33.7%, which is a very specific number, but even that has been beaten by home PV technologies getting up to 39% efficiency. And then what you have up on the ISS that's called multi-junction cells, that goes up to 45% efficiency. Granted, the ISS cells go for $300 million, which is kind of expensive, but you know, tech gets cheaper over time, who knows? Someday you might have that on the roof of your house. Now there is an issue that they call light-induced degradation that can actually reduce the efficiency by 0.5 to 1% per year. Uh, new technologies are combating that. But the point is, solar is still improving, and with the improved cost of battery storage coming along with it, it's going to be a major player in the energy grid over the years. It doesn't require much maintenance and it can last decades, which nets solar PV and LCOE score of $0.06 cents to $0.56, cents, which is a pretty wide range, but there are a lot of variables including commercial production and residential production and whatnot. Alright, so that's solar PV. There's also concentrated solar. So whereas photovoltaic solar uh, you know, absorbs light and that light breaks off some electrons that can then be used for electricity, um, concentrated solar actually collects energy as heat and then heats up water and does exactly what all the other sources like nuclear and coal and gas, what they all do. They heat up water, create steam, steam turns a turbine, turbine makes energy. And it's been around for a long time, over a hundred years. Now there are four different types of concentrated solar. There are trough systems that use curved mirrors to focus on a tube filled with oil. When it's heated, it goes through a steam generator that can generate up to 80 megawatts of electricity. Some of them have a tube in each trough, and then some combined troughs to heat up a larger oil tube. Only thing about this type is there's no thermal storage capacity. A dish system reflects into a receiver, which it heats and compresses as a fluid as it hits the receiver, then expanding it through a turbine or with a piston to produce a mechanical power. This mechanical power is then converted to up to 50 kilowatts of electrical power. In this CSP, like the trough system, it moves in tandem with the sun to take full advantage of the sunlight. These are known as heliostats. And then there's a central receiver system. This one uses dozens or even hundreds of parabolic mirrors to shoot their light energy at a central point, usually at the top of a tower. This central point is filled with a special type of salt that gets heated to 1050 degrees, which then heats water to turn a turbine. More importantly, it allows for storage of that heat. The sodium can actually hold onto the heat for up to 10 hours, meaning it's very consistent all around, even at night, kind of energy. Currently, the largest concentrated solar plant is in the UAE, which makes sense. They got plenty of sun there. And with little maintenance after it's built and 43% energy conversion, CSP systems come with an LCOE score of six cents to 25 cents per kilowatt hour. So I mentioned nuclear a second ago. Yeah, let's just jump over to that. Nuclear is the promise of the future and the devastation of the future, depending on who you ask. Nuclear has a bad rap. Mostly because when things go wrong with nuclear, they go spectacularly wrong. Uh, humans are pretty good at making things go spectacularly wrong, so there's a reason to be concerned about that. But man, they produce a ton of energy. The most powerful nuclear plant in the world is the Kashiwazaki Kariwa power plant in Japan at 8,212 megawatts, taking up only 4.6 square kilometers. Although currently it, it's, it's it's producing zero because Japan increased the quality standards after the Fukushima incident, so it's offline right now getting renewed and set up for that. Now to appreciate just how much energy that is, in India they have the Badla Solar Park, which covers 40 square kilometers to produce 2,245 megawatts. Whereas that space doesn't seem like a lot and until it does. It, it would take up this much space. Now, of course, nuclear comes with the waste issue. We all know about that, but it also has fuel that has to be mined and refined and processed in order to be used. All of that comes with a cost. But still, the plants are so powerful and efficient that it comes out with an LCOE score of five cents to 13 cents per kilowatt hour. So now on to one of my favorites, geothermal, which simply takes the heat from inside the earth and uses it to make electricity. I mean, think of all the hoops that we jump through in all these other energy systems just to heat up water and turn it into steam to make electricity out of it. With geothermal, it comes preheated. All you have to do is just use it. Traditionally, geothermal is limited to places with hot springs, usually along fault lines where the crust is cracked and all that heat from down below can get up easier to the surface. Places like Iceland that are all over geothermal energy. But there are newer methods where you can just drill down into the crust where it gets hot enough to heat up water to do work. Sometimes this is combined with a fluid with a lower boiling point like ammonia, where the heated water goes through a heat exchanger to heat up the ammonia, which flashes into a gas and then turns a turbine. This is known as enhanced geothermal. It's been calculated that geothermal could make up 10% of the US energy grid, so it's not the biggest player out there, but it's worth expanding. 
Because due to its simplicity and efficiency, it comes in with an LCOE of 5 cents to 15 cents per kilowatt hour. Now, if that ammonia trick sounded familiar, you might remember it from my video on ocean thermal energy conversion, which does basically the same thing by taking the temperature differential between cold, deep water and warmer surface water. Now, OTEC is brand new technology, really. It's still burgeoning, it's still in its infancy, it's still developing, so it's kind of hard to tell over its lifetime exactly what its LCOE score might be. But according to a research document that I'll link down in the description, it gets 10 to 17 cents per kilowatt hour depending on the size of the plant. And last but meh is tidal power. As a certain cable newsman once said, tide goes in, tide goes out. You can't explain that, but you can harness it. There's a lot of promise in tidal energy because the tides carry a lot of energy with it and it's regular. It happens every day, twice a day. It has nothing to do with the weather or anything else. It is regular, consistent energy. But it's also kind of tricky because you have to build a barrage which is basically like a dam underwater and that can cause problems with marine life. Now there's also the option of spinning vertical turbines underwater that can kind of capture that, uh, that tidal as it comes in, but um, spinning parts underwater sounds like a maintenance nightmare to me. But according to the International Energy Agency, it is expected to grow over time and it's projected LCOE of 15 cents per kilowatt hour for larger scale installations. For smaller scale ones, it actually gets a little pricey, closer to 40 cents per kilowatt hour. So, that was a lot of numbers thrown at your face. You kind of need to put them all on a chart to make any sense of it, so let's do that. And when we do that, we can see that the clear winners are hydroelectric followed by natural gas with coal and wind right about even behind it. Nuclear and geothermal are next in line followed by solar with OTEC, tidal, and offshore wind taking up the rear. So, there's good news and bad news here. I'll be honest, I really wanted to see solar do better than it shows up on here. I really wanted to make this video about how solar is destined to overcome coal, but as you can see, it's, it's not quite that simple. Because one thing that's not factored in here is storage. You know, uh, except for the concentrated solar with the sodium that can heat up overnight. Uh, regular solar PV, it only works half the day. It doesn't work at night, it's very intermittent. So you have to have some kind of storage solution for it to be some kind of baseline power. And that storage is gonna to add to the cost of solar if it's really gonna be comparable to coal. So as much as it's disappointing that it's not already whipping coal, it's actually kind of skewed in the wrong direction. Now, the good news is this is the situation right now and solar and storage are both plummeting in price over the last decade and will continue to do so. Whereas coal, as I mentioned earlier, it's a mature technology, it's not gonna get much cheaper. And the same is true for wind, which is already neck and neck with coal, but just like with solar, it is intermittent. So storage needs to be part of the equation. Storage and diversification. You know, many of these types of energy are location specific. You know, hydro gets crazy LCOE numbers, but you have to live near some kind of body of water and a lot of people just don't. Same is true for tidal and OTEC. Same could be said for traditional geothermal. It has to be you know, near a fault line where that kind of hot water is already at the surface. Uh, and it's already neck and neck with coal, which is great, but there's also this enhanced geothermal like I was talking about. This actually gets me really excited because theoretically you could drill deep down enough anywhere in the world and reach temperatures that are hot enough to get the job done. Like the deepest hole in the world, the Kola Super Deep Borehole in Russia, they reached a certain point and they had to stop not because they physically or mechanically couldn't drill any further down, but because it just got too hot. It got up to 180 degrees Celsius. Now granted, that's the deepest hole in the world and it took them decades to do it. But the point is, you go down deep enough and it'll get hot enough to be useful. And what I like even more about this is that the skills required for drilling for enhanced geothermal is almost the same as drilling for oil. Meaning as we phase out fossil fuels over the years, all of those displaced workers that are gonna be losing their, their livelihoods because of the fossil fuels going away, they can take those same hard earned skills that they've got and put it toward this. You know, there is a human cost to the policy changes that are required for us to really transform our energy grid. And there's always talk of retraining people who have been, you know, working in the oil fields to do something else. But in this case, you wouldn't have to retrain them at all. In fact, those skills are incredibly useful to this enhanced geothermal. Anyway, I think geothermal is really cool and the idea that we could be doing it in more places than just Iceland is really exciting to me. And last but not least is nuclear. Now again, it is neck and neck with uh, coal in terms of the LCOE, which is good. Um, but along with all the other problems associated with nuclear is the upfront cost. Nuclear power plants are extremely expensive and it's really hard to get the political will and the money together to make those things happen. Now granted, over the long term of 
the plant, which it can go on for decades, uh, it comes out pretty well. But it's kind of like the same argument that people make with electric cars. Like, yes, over its lifetime, it saves you money, but that doesn't really matter if you can't make the monthly payments for it. You know, there's also been a massive amount of advancement in nuclear technology over the years. Most of the nuclear plants that are in operation right now are working on technology that's decades old. And then you have the potential of small modular reactors, which I've never really covered on this channel, but that could bring the cost way down. Now that doesn't get rid of the problem of nuclear waste, but there's also the idea of nuclear diamond batteries. This is where they refine and compress down the nuclear waste into nano diamonds that actually release this uh, radiation and that radiation is captured and reused as electricity. So it can just power small devices and whatnot. But that's a whole infrastructure that hasn't been built out yet. It's more theoretical than anything at this point, but there is a use for the nuclear waste is the point there. So what did we learn today, kids? I learned through this exercise that if my Wu-Tang cash rules everything around me theory is correct, then natural gas and coal probably aren't going anywhere for a while. As long as they are the cheapest and most readily available source of energy out there, they will continue to kind of be a part of the energy grid if not dominate it. But wind and solar are coming up fast and starting to overtake them. And some would argue that the LCOE is heavily skewed in favor of the coal and natural gas sectors because it doesn't factor in the environmental cost of its waste product. You know, this is the idea behind the carbon tax, which I know is a heavily debated topic, but it's kind of like if you had a chemical company releasing chemicals into a river, you would expect that company to pay to clean up those chemicals. It's the same general idea, but that gets into policy, which is a whole other can of worms. So I'll put this to you. What did you make of these numbers? Good, bad, about what you expected? Did I leave anything out? Let me rephrase that. What did I leave out? <laughs> Let me know in the comments below. Oh, and as I mentioned before, there is a formula behind the LCOE, so if you wanted to play with that, you can totally do so, but if that doesn't make much sense to you, then you might want to bone up on your algebra. God knows I do. So maybe we should both go check out the Algebra Fundamentals course on Brilliant. Through 38 interactive quizzes covering 325 concepts, this course will put you on the road to actually understanding algebra, if you're anything like me anyway. You know, weirdly, I think I like the math courses on Brilliant the best because I really struggled with math in school. And there's something about the way Brilliant does it through the, the problem solving techniques that it has that just kind of makes it click into place for me for the first time, which is, which is kind of fun and exciting. And they do this with more than 60 courses on Brilliant, covering everything from classical physics courses to quantum mechanics courses, applied science, computer algorithms, even logical thinking and deductive reasoning. There's a ton of useful stuff to learn. And you learn it by problem solving, which kind of hacks your brain's natural learning skills so you can learn it in a way that makes the most sense to you and sticks with you long after you go back to watching cat videos. Plus you can do it on your mobile device and even offline so you can take it with you wherever you go. And they even have quick daily challenges to give you just a little tiny brain workout. It takes about 10 minutes of your time, but the effects of that add up. And if you want to get a taste of what I'm talking about, you can do the first section of any of their courses for free just to see what they're all about. But if you do sign up for a premium subscription that gives you access to all their courses and you're one of the first 200 people to do so at brilliant.org slash answers with Joe, you can get 20% off your premium subscription. So again, that's brilliant.org slash answers with Joe. Link is down below. Big thanks to Brilliant for supporting this video and a huge shout out to the supporters on Patreon and the channel memberships that help keep this channel going. I do appreciate all of you. Today I want to shout out some of the members who have signed up on YouTube. If you want to join them, you just hit the little join button down below. You get access to uh, live streams that are exclusive to supporters and early access to videos and whatnot. But the people whose names I need to murder are James Davis, Lilith Esme, Yao's Quite True, uh, Joseph Samaripas, Hassan Mohammed, GAW, Patrick Hanley, Daryl Feingold, Walter Staley, Lisa Kassen, Mark Johnson, and Deborah Lloyd. Thank you guys so much. If you'd like to join them again, just click the little join button down below and the magic will begin. Please do like and share this video if you liked it. And if this is your first time here, Google thinks you'll like that one, so why not? Or you can try any of the others down there that have my little face on them. And if you enjoy them and you wanna see more, I invite you to subscribe. Come back with videos every Monday. All right, that's it for now. You guys go out there, have an eye-opening week. And I'll see you next Monday. Love you guys. Take care.